Well, good afternoon and, and thanks everybody for your patience. We had a little bit of uh, technical challenges and getting some things loaded, but, uh, but we're here and we appreciate you uh, spending time with us this afternoon. Welcome to the Chamber's retrospective on the U.S. Cyberspace Solarium Commission, which played an important role in shaping the discussion on U.S. cyber policy now and well into the future. The Commission not only delivered a comprehensive and coherent report with specific recommendations to enhance our nation's cybersecurity, it also proposed specific legislative proposals, many of which are now law. All the while, commissioners and commission staff remain deeply engaged with the private sector and frequently took our input on how to shape and refine their recommendations. The commission took on some tough challenges, how to develop a coherent and articulate framework to deter malicious cyber activity, while also leveraging and reforming at the same time existing cyber policy and instruments of national power. Also, how can we arrive at an end state such that the full capabilities, authorities, and capacity of the US government and the private sector are harnessed to identify cyber threats, deter those behind such threats, reduce cyber risk, and respond appropriately and deliver consequences. Today's program is an opportunity to reflect on the Commission's work and also discuss what lies ahead for the public and private sectors. An overarching theme for our discussion today will be how to operationalize public-private sector partnership. First, I'd like to acknowledge our audience for the 100 plus questions that you submitted in the last 24 hours. We're gonna try and get through some of them. We'll try to get through as many as possible. Um, and we've sort of worked them in throughout our program. So thank you for that. There's some really good questions uh, and we appreciate it. For those of you who are would like to ask additional questions during the event, we'd encourage you to use the Slido function on your screen. It's clear that our members are passionate about cyber issues and are deeply invested in raising levels of national resilience to meet the current threat landscape. In fact, in his testimony before Congress yesterday, FBI Assistant Director for Cyber Brian Vordren had positive things to say about the commitment of the private sector to do right and do good, and those are my words summarizing, in collaborating with the government to improve cyber resilience and respond quickly to cyber incidents. We've got a great program for you today. We're very excited about it. We've got Solarium Commissioners Jim Langevin, Chris Inglis, and Frank Salufo. We also got have Mark Montgomery, who is the Executive Director of the Commission, Rob Morgus, a senior member of the staff of the Commission, who's now with Berkshire Hathaway Energy, and, and noted cyber expert Ben Flackard from J.P. Morgan Chase. We're going to start with Congressman Jim Langevin, who I had the opportunity to speak with last Friday. Many of you know that Congressman Langevin is retiring from Congress this year, but he's made a significant mark on U.S. cyber policy. He has a distinguished career as a cyber expert, and we're thrilled that he was able to spend some time with us. So please join me in welcoming Congressman Langevin. Congressman Langevin, thank you again for joining us. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you with us again, uh, almost two years to the day since we held our first Cyberspace Solarium Commission webinar on uh, March 17th, 2020. Um, uh, it's my pleasure to, 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 to speak with you. We've had a couple of our engagements over the years and uh, thrilled to have you. Thanks, Chris. Great to be with you again. And thanks, uh, thanks to the chamber uh, for affording this opportunity to have a great discussion about uh, more cyber issues. Yeah. So, well, yeah. So why don't we get right into it? And uh, I'll, I'll start a little bit with uh, the geopolitical situation. Uh, you've been a, 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 an advocate for strengthening the nation's cybersecurity. You're a founding member of the Congressional Cybersecurity Caucus and a key member of the U.S. Cyberspace Solarium Commission. In the two years since the publication of the commission's original report, Congress has enacted almost 60 percent of the 52 legislative recommendations of the commission. That's a tremendous accomplishment. And today, we're, we're witnessing a significant war in Ukraine. And aside from the terrible physical destruction the Russians are causing, they're also attempting to use information warfare and cyber campaigns against Ukrainian public and private entities. Now, many cybersecurity observers and experts who predicted cyber attacks with significant consequences have been a little bit surprised by what seems to be a low-intensity cyber conflict. 
So I'd be interested in you as a cyber expert. How do you view this? Have things in the cyber environment in the Ukraine theater rolled out as you expected? Well, uh, thanks for the question. It, obviously, very important uh, in this time of geopolitical unrest and, and uh, the war in Ukraine is 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 outrageous and it uh, it's just criminal what's what's happening over there. And, and I hope that uh, we're imposing significant um, uh, costs on Vladimir Putin, uh, the international community. I'm pleased to see that President Biden has led the community to uh, impose uh, serious sanctions on Russia and Vladimir Putin. And those around him, and I, I hope we can continue the pressure there, and we end this war as, as soon as possible. Uh, but I, you know, I have been somewhat um, surprised that we haven't seen more offensive cyber operations by the Russians uh, in Ukraine. Although and, and around the world, there are there uh, are certainly uh, cyber operations going on, but not to the scale that uh, that I had uh, expected yet. But we have to be on guard. I think that. President Biden was right to warn um, uh, the U.S. and uh, the, the private sector uh, that we need to be on alert because, according to President Biden, uh, intelligence does show that the, that the Russians uh, could be uh, getting ready to carry out some type of uh, offensive cyber operations against U.S. entities. So uh, I'm very uh, uh, concerned about that. I applaud uh, Director Easterly at CISA. Cybersecurity Information Security Agency at at uh, Infrastructure Security Agency at CISA at uh, DHS. Uh, they have the Shields Up program, and I would encourage uh, any and all businesses to go on uh, to, to CISA.gov and uh, get their uh, Shields Up uh, recommendations so that entities can uh, better protect them themselves. Should uh, the Russians uh, start carrying out offensive cyber operations against us or or, or U.S. entities? Yeah, I mean, it seems that, and this is something that the chamber similarly has been very active uh, with CISA uh, and with uh, the FBI and other government agencies in, in, in promoting the Shields Up campaign, in talking to our members, uh, and, and, and sort of pushing the idea of plan, don't panic. Be ready uh, for what's coming and, uh, and, and, and do the things that you need to do now. Uh, including conduct cyber incident response uh, planning um, and, and incident uh, exercises so that if and when something happens, there's a little bit of muscle memory on how to react and get back to it. So thank you for that, uh, for that, for that, uh, uh, that input. Um, you know, one of the things, um, and, and that was sort of, this gets nicely to my next question, which, which relates to the increasing drumbeat from the administration about the potential for malicious uh, Russian-sponsored cyber attacks against UN, U.S. entities. And looking at the work of the Solarium Commission uh, in this environment, um, what, what legislation and practices that have come out of the commission do you believe have made a positive impact on the nation's cyber posture uh, right now, recognizing that a lot of these things take time to sort of ingest and, 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 and become formalized, but where, what are the things that have happened so far that have actually uh, inured to the benefit of our cybersecurity? So uh, a number of things that are that are really important. First of all, we were able to create uh, the, the the first ever Senate confirmed national cyber director position, and uh, and that's a, a, I think a game changer uh, going forward with helping to better coordinate U.S. policy and you know have a a, a point person that private sector can look to and work with. Uh, as we show up our, our uh, private sector uh, cyber defenses. Uh, also very pleased with, of course, the additional funding we've been able to uh, obtain for, for CISA uh, and uh, Director Easterly and her team there so that they build their cyber capabilities. That's one of the things that we had called for uh, in, uh, in, in Solarium and the Congress in general, working to make sure that CISA was uh, stood up and, uh, and is uh, strengthened, I should say. And so they, I applaud that the work that they're doing. Uh, there's still other things that we need to focus on, but also creating the, the Joint Cyber Planning Office within CISA was another Solarium Commission recommendation so that we can war game out, if you will, where our vulnerabilities might exist and what our responses should be uh, in the event that there is a, a significant cyber incident that, that takes place. But uh, more work to be done and uh, you know, the, the, the efforts continue, but I'm very pleased with 
the, the recommendations that have been uh, enacted by Congress, uh, again, coming right out of the Solar Commission's recommendations, we had a high success rate and you know, great credit goes to all of my colleagues on the Solar Commission and especially, of course, uh, our co-chairs, uh, Senator King and Congressman Gallagher, along with Senator Sass, uh, the four of us have worked ex extremely well together in getting these uh, these recommendations of the Solar Commission uh, across the finish line enacted into law. Yeah, I'd say as an outside observer, but uh, active in in working with the the commission, the commission staff, and and many of the commissioners like yourself, I'd have to say you know, for us it was very interesting and very gratifying to see a bipartisan, extremely professional group of people with the best interests of the nation in mind, work out and come up with a very comprehensive yet digestible report and recommendations, which then led to, as we talked about, uh, a significant number of legislative uh, accomplishments. So I think, you know, this is not one of those commission reports that's going to sit on the shelf somewhere. It's it's actively being worked. And so you you and your and your colleagues deserve tremendous credit for that. And and I'd like to stay on this topic of maybe the unfinished business of the commission and and talk a little bit about some of the key priorities maybe that you have or, or others um, uh, in the coming year and, and thereafter. So you know, you've been a very strong proponent of codifying systemically important critical infrastructure. Um, so if you would, maybe tell us a little bit about you know, why you think this is important and where do you see the benefits for companies so designated and, and what might be some of the burdens uh, for, for those companies? Yeah, so very important. Still more work to be done, uh, one of which is creating the, uh, the joint collaborative environment, uh, which would allow uh, basically our intelligence uh, apparatus to work more closely with systemically important critical infrastructure. Uh, so I'll start with certainly we need to more specifically identify what constitutes systemically important critical infrastructure and and then define the, the benefits and burdens uh, for them. If if they are, you want to think of it uh, in terms of a systemically important uh, critical infrastructure entity would be a, a large enough company that if they were hit with a major cyber uh, incident or attack, uh, the colonial pipeline, that it's not just the company that has a bad day, but it's the country that has a bad day. And then um, the, the entity has to be mature enough that if they're given uh, intelligence uh, or warnings as, per se, that they'll actually be able to act on and do something with that, that they have the, you know, I, I, in internal um, procedures for be able to take on and take in, in important intelligence information and then uh, act on it to close vulnerabilities uh, ag aggressively. So with that, again, th th there'd be you know uh, benefits and burdens. Um, we wanna make sure that they're getting the benefit of uh, additional and updated uh, intelligence information. But with that, uh, we, we require uh, more um, robust incident reporting, uh, you know, almost as close to real time as possible so that we can inoculate not only the company, but the, the other, uh, Critical infrastructure entities and um, and get kind of working more closely together to identify those uh, those those problems, putting context, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, and, and in some ways also uh, potentially uh, liability protection for the uh, the systemically important critical infrastructure entities if they're you know they're meeting all the requirements uh, to have robust uh, cybersecurity internally and uh, incident reporting where where required. Yeah, and I think you mentioned liability protection, and I do want to talk. Uh, in, in a bit about the, uh, the the cyber incident reporting legislation that uh, re that passed this year, but before we get there, you, you mentioned something else about intelligence community engagement with critical infrastructure, uh, and that's something that we at the chamber have been very supportive of over the years. Um, you know, we were hoping to get those two recommendations from the Solarium Commission report, the uh, five one one and five one two. They're sort of burned in my memory. Uh, but you know, couldn't quite get those over the hurdle, over the over the over the uh, bump. Um, you know, we've we've talked with lots of government agencies. There seems to be a lot of agreement that there's an opportunity for engagement in this area for critical infrastructure entities to maybe you know be able to convey to the intelligence community where they have you know what would be inf important to know if the IC came across information about certain threats. Um, 
And, um, you know, but it, it, like there seems a little bit of resistance there. So if you have any uh, suggestions on how we might be able to get those over the hump, you know, we're all ears. We'd, we'd love to hear it because um, yeah. we think it's an important component. So it's going to be a priority for me, this Congress, uh, uh, to get the joint collaborative environment across the finish line um, because it would create a uh, competent operating tools for U.S. intelligence agencies and, and, and private sector critical infrastructure to share information in real time and, and help each side understand context of the information that they are seeing. And, and so that's one thing that is lacking right now, that you know, the copper, common operating tools for sharing and analyzing uh, the data, the threats that we see. Uh, the, the JCE uh, would, 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 would change that. And uh, I'm, I'm excited about the prospects of that uh, that legislation getting across the finish line. You know, the, the intelligence community would still uh, determine you know, what's to be shared, but then at least you'd have a, a way, a process of, of sharing it, how to share it, and how to analyze that data. Eminently yeah. reasonable. So, well, count us in. We're very interested in that. Um, and then here's something that that you know that did pass, which is the the joint, the joint cyber planning cell, or the J, which sort of evolved into the JCDC. Um, from your perspective, um, you know, it seems like there's been a lot of positive discussion on the JCDC and how Director Easterly and her team have been using it. Um, you know, what's your view on it? Is it becoming a useful planning construct in addition to the information sharing role that it seems to be taking on? Yeah, very pleased with uh, with uh, JCDC. I think it's really important. Um, you know, again, for starters, you know, it's going to better facilitate. Uh, Government and private sector working more closely uh, together, and uh, and that's where I think the, the the joint collaborative environment fits in very well with uh, with uh, JC uh, JCDC. But again, an opportunity for uh, for private sector and government to work more closely together, um, and uh, you know, we're paying dividends for the private sector, our partners who you know I believe in, should include you know the owners and operators, systemically important uh, critical infrastructure. But well, it's also interesting that you know this 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 construct this was put together and immediately had multiple opportunities to work operationally. So you know it's 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 sort of striking in the sense that sometimes you know you put something together and it might be years before it actually is is tested. But we've had three or four instances of it already, and I think you know with the Ukraine situation, it's going to just continue. So that'll uh, that'll allow people to build up some some quick. Uh, quick uh, uh, operating pra practices and and some some very valuable lessons learned. Yeah, absolutely. And in my conversations with officials at the Department of Homeland Security um, and CISA, uh, I've been I've been particularly uh, encouraged by the the willingness of the uh, the private sector uh, to to participate. And again, it's been a, it's been off to a, I think a, a great start. If, if I could, um, I know we're kind of coming up on time, but um, we talked earlier about uh, briefly the, 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 the cyber incident reporting legislation that, that Congress just passed for critical certain critical infrastructure entities. Of course, the goal of this legislation is to enhance the government's visibility into cyber incidents of significant consequence and provide trend analysis and warnings where possible. Um, one of the key or for us, one of the important parts of the of the law um, is the reference to regulatory harmonization. So, in exchange for uh, companies providing uh, information to CISA uh, in a central manner, it's being held confidential. There's liability protections, as you had mentioned in other contexts, um, but it also tasks CISA to identify and harmonize other uh, reporting requirements. Now, at the same, which which again we very supportive of. Uh, at the same time, the SEC recently, uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission announced a proposed cybersecurity disclosure rule that would require, among other things, publicly traded companies to disclose cyber incidents within four days on, on an 8K. And when we look at these two, this the law and, and the will of Congress versus the SEC proposed rule, uh, you know, it seems to us that Congress has spoken and uh, and and use things like confidentiality and li liability protection um, as a means to foster a virtuous circle of 
of reporting and action. It also, the confidentiality piece also allows uh, government to take action on information quickly and maybe warn other uh, entities in that industry or other industries of potential impending uh, or in-process attacks. To us, it would seem like the, the Security and Exchange Commission rule, proposed rule with a four-day uh, window and public disclosure could upend that, uh, that intent of Congress uh, and maybe moving in a slightly different direction. So uh, to the extent you, you have views on this, we would, I would welcome your thoughts on that. Yeah, so we definitely want to harmonize what you know uh, Congress is thinking and, and what the SEC uh, is, is working on and taking action on. And I'll say that you know Congress has already made it clear uh, that substantially similar reporting requirements should in fact be uh, be streamlined, and uh, you know, that, that's a major reason why uh, the legislation, um, uh, uh, you know, it, it, um, you know, was was drafted this way. Uh, you know, the intent is to create uh, is not to create another reporting burden for, for covered entities on. Uh, on, on top of their existing uh, regulations. So um, uh, again, major reason why legislation created a cyber uh, incident reporting council uh, to coordinate, uh, deconflict and, and harmonize federal incident uh, reporting requirements, including those uh, issued through uh, regulations. And and so as as CISA develops the rule to implement uh, you know this new law uh, and specifically determine the specific parameters of the uh, of, of uh, a covered incident I expect to work closely uh, with regulators uh, and uh, I think that will help them proactively identify opportunities really to, to streamline uh, the reporting process and establish uh, really interagency agreements those those agreements I believe in, in streamlined information sharing pathways need to be clearly communicated of course uh, to covered entities. And the, the goal should be uh, to avoid a rollout where, where covered entities uh, aren't sure, for example, who they need to be talking to in case of a breach. And, you know, more specifically on uh, the, you know, the SEC, um, you know, obviously information and national security agencies uh, can, can share with uh, lifeline sectors, uh, but this share is, is, is sensitive and not all of it should be made public. But um, I, I will say I do, you know, I. Uh, I do think we can balance those sensitivities with a need to uh, help shareholders better understand cyber risks. Um, uh, Post-breach disclosure, of course, is a really important part uh, of that risk communication for material incidents. And, uh, and look, you know, shareholders should be able to know um, the general nature of an incident if they're substantially likely uh, to consider that information important. And, uh, and then, you know, to be sure, communicating about uh, cyber risk uh, before an incident occurs is also important. But you know, shareholders it really should be able to determine, uh, you know, between uh, you know companies that take cybersecurity seriously and and those who don't. And that's you know, that's certainly a part of this this goal uh, also. Fair enough. Thank you very much again. For your time. You've been very generous with us, not just today, but but in the last two years and and beyond. And. We, we really enjoy working with you. You've got top-notch staff, really sharp people. And, um, you know, we're, we'll continue to work with you during your term in Congress. And uh, we are, uh, you know, count us in as, a, as, a, uh, as an honest broker. So thank you again for your time. Well, thank you for yours as well. And I do look at this as a public-private partnership. We are stronger when we're in this together. And uh, we're doing this collaboratively in terms of getting to a place where we strengthen our cybersecurity together. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Vince Fosse, VP for Cyber Policy here at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and I'm delighted to be joined uh, by Mark Montgomery, uh, former senior advisor to the chairman of the U.S. Cyberspace Solarium Commission, um, and he previously also served as its executive director uh, for this fireside chat. Um, and Mark, welcome. Uh, would love to just jump right into it, exactly where 
Congressman Langevin started out. Um, and that's talking about the current geopolitical situation in Ukraine, uh, the war in Ukraine. And now that we're watching a significant threat against critical infrastructure, you know, looking back on the commission's work, um, what recommendations have made um, national resilience um, a better, more enhanced, um, and where are they not? Well, first, thank you very much for having me, Vince, and, and great to follow Representative Langevin, who's been a real trailblazer on this issue. Look, I, I think in general, you have to acknowledge that legislative changes usually take about two years to take hold and show meaningful change. So changes that, that we passed, you know, 16 months ago and four months ago are, are by their definition, going to have limited uh, impact. I think our appropriations impact could be a little higher. Those you can see in 12 to 18 months of so some of the appropriations changes about 14 months ago, you're starting to see their impact. Uh, so with that caveat, I'd, I'd probably say that while no specific recommendation has been determinative as we enter this crisis with Russia, I think the strengthening of CISA, both the authorities and the appropriations over, over the last uh, 18 months has, has made a big impact. We had seven authority changes and about uh, four different appropriations levels that we were pushing. And, and I think we've really seen those great success with that. And, and so I think that is probably the biggest area of success. And, and you see that in um, in Jen Easterly's kind of public leadership role as, you know, kind of the quarterback of the team. And I think specifically probably the creation of the Joint Cyber Planning Office, which has morphed uh, under Director Easterly into the Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative. But, you know, it's legal underpinnings or legislative underpinnings are in the Joint Cyber Planning Office and its appropriations come that way, too. They, they are having an impact. You know, if you ask me. You know, looking forward, I'd say given another six to 12 months, the, the creation of the National Cyber Director, as mentioned by uh, Representative Langevin, and, and the force structure assessment of Cybercom, that, that, that's going to drive significant increases in the size of the cyber mission force. And, and probably one last one, strengthening the sector risk management agencies. That, that is the codification of support that we expect these agencies to provide to the private sector. Those last three, NCD, the force structure assessment, and sector risk management agencies, I think over the next six to 12 months, they'll have the biggest impact. Yeah, that's great. And I really want to pick up on, we'll come back to the congressional appropriations here in a second. Um, but also, you know, there was, a, there was a ton of the commission's recommendations that were certainly enacted into the law, but, but what wasn't impacted that, you know, you and um, the Cyberspace Solarium Commission 2.0 really are focused on the next you know, I think looking forward, you know, first, we need to pick up the the, pe the hardest legislation that didn't get done. That would be the what uh, Representative Langer referred to, the joint collaborative environment, and then uh, the systemically important critical infrastructure, which um, which uh, Chris Roberti averred to in his discussion. Uh, and and a handful, there's a handful of others like Bureau of Cyber Statistics uh, that we'll be pushing. And so you'll see all of those, you know, in play again this year. Uh, and then we have a whole new set of issues that uh, we're tackling under our, our 501c3 uh, in terms of future legislation. Yeah, that's great. And, you know, one of the ones that you and I have talked about in the past that, that was enacted into law and, and, and hasn't yet seen some of the maturation in terms of programming process and outreach to private sectors, continuity of economy planning. Can you talk a little bit about where, where you might see that going, either through the 501c3 or... Uh, some of the work at, at, at FED more broadly. Uh, so you're exactly right. And this is a level of frustration. So we actually did pass this. It was a tough piece of legislation. It required 25 committees between the House and the Senate to get it cleared. You can imagine that it took a total of about 270 clearances over a two-week period. That, that was painful. We got it done. It gave the Biden administration, you know, it, was a, it came into law after the veto and the override, January 1st of, uh, you know, 50, 15 months ago, and it gave the administration 24 months to tackle this. And so we're 15 months into, uh, you know, you do the math, that's about 60%. And uh, frankly, uh, I don't think much work has happened yet. And, and the reason we gave them two years on, on, our, on our report about how to tackle an issue was that it's hard and uh, kind of frittering away 60% of the time doesn't make it easier. Uh, and why it's hard is this is about how do you prioritize what infrastructures to bring back during a, a massive uh, critical infrastructure failure. You know, and we were thinking largely about, you know, cyber enabled, it could be others. The problem is you can't apply the normal FEMA math to this. You know, that's usually isolated to one, two or three states. And this could easily be a multi-state 
factor, uh, uh, you know, multi-state um, damage across 10, 12 states. If you think about loss of the Northeast power grid across all 16 major critical infrastructures, it's going to take leadership, that, you know, emanating from, you know, the Secretary of Homeland Security using CISA and FEMA and then relying on the other federal agencies to support. So it's going to need backstopping by the White House. And uh, so we think that kind of leadership and planning needs to be done in advance. It needs to be exercised and tested. Uh, you need to determine what's the sequencing of electrical power grid, water, finan key financial services, so you can get your major exchanges back up and running you know, and preserve not just our national security and our public health and safety, but also our economic viability and development. And you know, that takes planning, and it takes exercising, and then it takes replanning. And right now, they're, you know, we're coming up short and just doing the planning. Uh, Senator King and Representative Gallagher sent a note to the president uh, at the end of December saying exactly this, uh, just describing their discomfort with the delay and then asking that the president specifically uh, call out Secretary Mayorkas and Director Easterly to lead this because we think they're two people uniquely skilled and placed uh, to lead this effort. Very thoughtful uh, thoughts on, on the continuity of economy planning. You can see how that integrates well with the original JCPO and, and, and uh, the reforms, uh, strengthening of CISA. Um, in that kind of same vein, wanted to ask for your thoughts on the congressional appropriations. The president released his budget this year. I'd love for your, you to walk around kind of the interagency and where and offer your perspective on where where DOD, uh, President Zimperin on, on DOD, certainly CISA. NCD and commerce, if you could offer a few thoughts kind of around. Sure. So <clears throat> listen, uh, the appropriations bill did provide significant funding increases for a number of critical cybersecurity programs, including CISA and, uh, and in the Department of Defense and in the Department of Energy. Um, but it really only addressed, addressed about half the federal government cybersecurity mandate. And I, th I think I can understand why and explain that in a second. I first want to say on CISA, look, current budget, two billion. The president asked for 2.1 billion. We in the administration, in the uh, Cyberspace Salarium Commission, were recommending 2.5 billion. <clears throat> the House and the Senate both came up with versions around 2.5 billion. But then, when they uh, when they put together the comprehensive bill, they came out with the highest common denominator, uh, denominator of almost uh, you know 2.59 or almost 2.6 billion dollars. It's fantastic. It's the right amount to spend. It get, puts money into sector risk management agencies. You know, puts money into voluntary threat detection. Puts money into cybersecurity education and training assistance programs, puts money in the Joint Cyber Planning Office. You know, <clears throat> we were very happy with that. Um, we re uh, the, well, we recognize that, the, you know, similarly, the, the NIST programs, National Institute for Standards and Technology, the Department of Commerce, its cybersecurity programs barely got, I should say that CISA increase in the end was about 28%. Um, by comparison, NIST cybersecurity efforts got about a 1.5% bump. The uh, National Science Foundation Scholarship for Service got a 5% bump. Both of these are well, you know, underneath inflation and, uh, and, and unacceptable. And, and what really happened was they had much larger bumps. They had 15% increases in each of them recommended by the president and by the congressional committees. But I think at the very end game of budgeting, you know, instead of using a scalpel, a chainsaw was brought in and the non-DOD discretionary budget was probably cut about 10%. That's what it looks like to me. Um, CISA avoided this because uniquely its budget is actually housed inside the Department of Defense as 050 funding. And so, um, uh, but these, these two non-CISA important uh, 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 federal agencies, NIST and National Science Foundation, did not get the kind of increases they need. So there's a disappointing end. I think the exciting end is more at CISA, DOD, and the Department of Energy. Yeah, I just want to put a fine point on, on the importance of, of NIST funding. Um, especially in terms of uh, the NIST cybersecurity framework update that is um, that the, the the agency is uh, just beginning its private kind of outreach on um, and the importance there. Um, two two last kind of appropriations questions um, I wanted to, to ask you. Um, any thoughts on kind of where you see uh, the Department of Energy's um, uh, cybersecurity investments going and whether that is through the president's budget crust uh, this year through things like the um, uh, the Infrastructure Act um, and then related, um, you know, congressional the, the president's annual budget isn't the only appropriations vehicle uh, for our agenda. 
uh, it, it, it call, includes also our competition package, uh, whether you, that's USICA or Competes Act, where you see some strategic investments that the administration and Congress is looking to make uh, to enhance national cyber resilience. And so that, that's a good point. You know, CSER got in the last budget, they got a 20% bump instead of maybe the 30% bump the administration argued for. I still think they're doing well there. Uh, it's hard to see the details. You can see DOE had a bump in the 23 budget. Hard, we don't have the real details yet on CSER's break in there. But I, I, I'm confident the administration's continue to invest in, in CSER. So I think, and that's the cybersecurity and uh, and uh, the Office of Cybersecurity and Energy Security Emergency Response at the Department of Energy. So I'm excited to see that. That's good investments by the president uh, by, and the Congress. Um, USICA and, and competes are being uh, conferenced now in a will be conference soon in, in between the House and the Senate. And I'm excited here. You know, there is a lot of really good cybersecurity legislation in here. So a limited amount of it's in both bills. I think that stuff's pretty safe, could go through. That includes, and, and well, not cybersecurity directly, you know, we are watching the $52 billion for chips and kind of ORAN 5G emergency appropriation. So glad to see that. But kind of more boring stuff, but really important. There's a legislation in both bills for a federal rotational cyber workforce program. There's a, there's um standard set. There's funding to allow us to participate more fulsomely and international standard setting organizations so we can push for transparent and rules-based approaches to international standards and instead of the Chinese kind of sovereignty, um, you know, government uh, access kind of approaches uh, to, to standard setting. There's also money for regional technology hubs um, and the uh, refunding the Global Engagement Center State Department, all, all good things. Uniquely in the um, and the Senate bill is our codifying of national risk management cycle. We think that's a really important part of resilience. It's about making sure you have a five-year plan for how you uh, identify risks uh, and, and resolve them you know, with resources. Uh, it identifies CISA as the national risk manager very clearly. And then in the House version, there's a, an appropriate level of funding for the Federal Cyber Core Scholarship for Service Program, You know, the ROTC-like program that brings workers into the government. It's a fantastic program, bringing in 500 a year, should be bringing in about 1,000 a year. Uh, you know it's good because NSA and CIA are first in line to grab uh, graduates from it, you know, and they could hire from anywhere and they hire from inside the government's programs. And then uh, Representative Langevin put a critical technology security center amendment in along with Representative Gallagher, one of the few bipartisan amendments on the Competes Act, and I'm hoping that gets through. So a lot of really good stuff, and there's about five or six other smaller ones we could get a lot of accomplished through this conference if they have a strong cybersecurity eye on the future. That's a great summation of the USICA Competes Act um, uh, investment. So if, foot, want to footstop the chamber support for the CHIPS, chips funding um, and certainly some of the other creative blue technology investments, whether that's artificial intelligence, quantum, post-quantum encryption, cryptography, um, and uh, some of the next generation communications and especially on the, the standard setting investments that that, that that's critical to, to um, enhancing foundational research and development. Um, we've got time for kind of one last question. You've covered the waterfront pretty well on the future legislation um, mentioned in particular some of the cyber workforce, uh, but water sector is a passion project for you. Um, it related to just kind of the, the sector interest, um, I've got a member question here um, related to um, what is being done to uh, to harden and modernize national SCADA systems from cyber attacks? Many of these systems are geographically distributed and vulnerable, but both perform critical monitoring and controlling functions for our grids um, and ONG segment. So I wanted to see if you could offer a kind of closing thought on, on water um, and industrial control system cybersecurity. No, that's, that's a great point. Um, well, yeah, I, water is a, a passion for me, and I, I think that... Um, you know, the water sector suffers from two things. One, it is a uniquely kind of a state and local utility driven sector, which means not a wealthy center, hard to raise funds. So cybersecurity is often uh, a challenge to get funded. It, and it's mixed with uh, oversight from EPA, which is just not up to the mark when you compare it to the other sector risk management agencies. It's not even in the ballpark. So you have this kind of like perfect storm of a, a tough infrastructure for getting the funding combined with um, poor uh, uh, executive branch oversight. So, or insufficient funding for the oversight. Um, 
So what, what I what I'll tell you there is uh, we're coming out. We've we've come out with recommendations last November that we need a a NERC like you know kind of an industry led uh, regulatory framework. You know, with oversight by the executive branch, which I think they can lightly do right now. But, you know, industry is really leading this, not us. The, the ideas we have come from industry. Uh, we also need to strengthen EPA's uh, ability to do their job. We need to strengthen CISA's support to the EPA in, in doing their job because CISA does have the professionals in cybersecurity to do this. We need to make sure that water sector companies, you know, currently they compete with like, you know, droughts and climate change and rising water and, you um, you know, like you know, four signs of the apocalypse, and then oh, by the way, cybersecurity. The cybersecurity doesn't get too many of those grants when they compete in that environment, and so uh, we need to have ex actually money set aside for cybersecurity so that uh, the water utilities can access these uh, grants for the state revolving uh, programs. So there's a lot of opportunity here um, to get better at water, but we have to because you're only as strong as your weakest link. If water doesn't work, eventually electrical power is affected because they need that cooling effluent. And when, when, when electrical power, when the electrical grid's affected, eventually all infrastructure is affected. So there's a, uh, you can only be as strong as that weakest link. Our weakest link is water. We need to make the appropriate investments. Mark, thanks very much. Really enjoyed the conversation with you this afternoon. I think members will take a lot away from it in terms of the commission's work and what comes next for CSC 2.0. Um, Chamber's looking forward to working with you and so are our members. So. Thanks very much for your time. I want to turn it over now to uh, Frank Salufo um, from Auburn University. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Vince. Hello, everyone. Really excited to talk about one of my favorite topics today, operationalizing cybersecurity. And obviously couldn't think about of a better group than the Chamber of Commerce to host this discussion. Um, I think we've all been around the public-private partnership discussion, which is a, a little pedestrian. I think we need to be able to move forward and, 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 and aggressively so beyond admiring problems and actually implementing solutions. And, and clearly um, operationalizing cybersecurity fits that realm. Maybe as a bit of stage setting, uh, I think there are two criteria that define success in any genuine collaborative effort and partnership. The first, uh, obviously trust. Trust is the coin of the realm. Uh, it takes a long time to build and nanoseconds to lose. Uh, and secondly, giving and taking, just the word itself, collaboration. It can't be a, a free rider, a giver, and a taker. It needs to be uh, genuinely collaborative. Uh, and couldn't think of two better people to shed light on this topic than Rob Morgus, uh, as well as uh, Ben Flatgard. Both have experience on both sides of the uh, transom, both sides of the uh, equation on this uh, uh, important topic. Um, Rob uh, has served valiantly in the Cyber Solarium Commission as a principal staffer, uh, and Ben served in the National Security Council working cyber issues before moving over to JPMC. Um, so why don't we sort of start with a little bit of table setting and, and what do we mean by operationalizing uh, uh, cybersecurity? What does it look like? What are our goals? Uh, and then obviously I'd love to touch on some of the impediments and obstacles, but uh, but Ben, maybe we'll start with you and then turn to Rob, who's at Berkshire Hathaway. Rob, hopefully you're on. So uh, Ben, you wanna start us off? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks a lot, Frank, and thanks to the Chamber for having me here. Um, I think it's, uh, firstly, it's sort of important, as, as you said, where we're starting to, to just look at what do we mean by operational collaboration? I think you know, for good or ill, it's become a buzzword, which is is fantastic. Um, in terms of the idea that that it means to me, and and that and that we think of at J.P. Morgan when we promote operational collaboration, you know, I look to the the definition that the New York Cyber Task Force, which which I was a part of and we supported, came up with. Um, you know, I think it's the most succinct. They said the integrated public-private preparation and response to severe cyber crises. Um, I think, you know, as you pointed out, collaboration is an important word, and it, it means 
give and take and, and contributions from uh, multiple parties. I think integration is another uh, important word. And, you know, unfortunately, I think sometimes uh, in the early stages of operational collaboration, we've done sort of side by side developments um, of different capabilities and tools, but they haven't really been integrated. And so I think as we look to the next phase, and we can talk about this more later, look to the next phase of development in this space, integration is going to be uh, as important uh, of a word as, as collaboration. Um, so our, our goal really is to collaborate across critical infrastructure. I think critical infrastructure to critical infrastructure is important, as well as with government. Um, you know, Solarium took a really significant step forward in sort of coalescing what public policy looks like around operational collaboration and how we think about operationalizing some of these concepts and goals. Um, public policy around partnership in cybersecurity has existed for, you know, over 20 years now. Um, but Solarium really boiled down the needs for some of the specific enablers um, that will, you know, that will lead to, to better operational integration. So, you know, from our perspective, we really need to build capabilities that support both planning and risk analysis, uh, threat detection, and, and then incident response and recovery. Um, one example of that is is the JCD, what's become the JCDC, right? As we've heard, uh, you know, and we're grateful for Congress's action in the 2021 NDAA to, to take that idea from Solarium and put money behind it. Um, and JCDC is now, you know, it was formed as the Joint Planning Center coming out of, of Solarium. Uh, it's expanded its role a, bit, a little bit, and I think that's that's useful and, and appropriate. Um, we're seeing it now in real time in this, you know, heightened geopolitical um, climate, playing both a planning, you know, sort of in, in near real time planning role, as well as an incident management role. Um, I think as we as we look forward to to greater operationalization, you know, one of the keys is going to be figuring out what the inherent roles are that are best suited to the government and private sector. Um, again, as I said, like I think we've done uh, quite a bit of of development in in terms of collaborative capabilities, uh, but sometimes they're a bit duplicative as well. And so I think focusing on our core strengths and, and where there's, you know, sort of a, a natural economies and efficiencies um, is going to be really important. So government, for instance, is unique in its ability to conduct cyber operations, uh, right, and certain types of intelligence collection. Uh, so the agencies and authorities with those capabilities are going to have to develop and be specifically resourced to bring um, those those authorities and capabilities to bear in support of critical infrastructure. You know, likewise, industry is responsible for operating almost all of critical infrastructure, as as we've all noted. Um, and so, as as useful as things like the uh, uh, you know sort of risk management, national risk management center, and national critical function work is. Um, it can't be a supplement for the, the work that industry has to do in that space. Industry really has to lead the identification of risk within its critical infrastructure and, and, and take responsibility for developing mitigating actions within that in infrastructure. So, you know, the result of that needs to be shared with government and we need to work with government on that. But I don't think we gain any efficiencies from, or, you know, or, or actually, you know, effectuate any, any real change if we look to government to necessarily lead that sort of work. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Ben. And Rob, I, I believe you're with us. Maybe uh, maybe on the phone. Oh, there you are in, in person. Good to see you guys uh, hanging. Yeah. And all, good stuff. So, um, so Rob, I, I mean, I, I'd love to sort of get your thoughts, but also um, two big orders of unfinished business from Solarium are, are obviously fully realizing the joint cyber collaborative environment. And, and, and I do believe JCDC is off to a good start, but, but there are probably some additional authorities that need to be codified either by law or, or uh, through other means. So I'd be curious what your thoughts are there. And, and I cannot talk about any issues these days without foot stomping the significance around SICI or systemically important critical infrastructure. So uh, floor is over to you and uh, glad you were able to join us. Yeah, thanks for that, Frank. And thanks for having me to both you and the chamber. Sorry, I'm a little late. Um, so I, I caught this sort of, I caught most, I think, of, of Ben's comments. And I, I would agree with most of it. The one area where I might sort of push back a tiny bit is on the risk front. Um, I agree that companies 
are going to need to be the ones that identify their own risk. I think that we do need some help understanding cross-sectoral uh, and broader sort of national level risk. That's not something companies on our own are necessarily equipped to do. And that is where I think there is a sweet spot for, uh, you know, work like uh, the National Risk Management Center, the potential National Risk Management Cycle, uh, which I know is is potentially going to pass through in Usica later, hopefully later this, I guess, next month. Um, specifically, though, because you brought it up, Frank, on the JCDC and SICI, you're right. And I would, you know, I, I would be uh, remiss if I didn't mention that we are, you know, from, from my perspective, we are seeing some value already in relationships and in some of the efforts that the federal government is undertaking, particularly around sort of the geopolitical events of today. JCDC is playing no small role in that. Um, and, you know, as is for us, DOE and other partners in the federal government, I think the, uh, you know, the area where JCDC can potentially provide even greater value is to your point in this sort of joint collaborative environment concept. Um, and it's not necessarily that JCDC needs authorities to create the environment or to share information with the private sector. But I think what's missing right now, and this is sort of the sweet spot of the Solarium recommendation, is an authority that would allow them to harmonize the way that the federal government collects cyber information so that they can put it in a place where it is easily accessible, it's easily triageable, it talks with itself, um, and, and it's interoperable. That's the biggest authority that I think, you know, the, the JCE recommendation and now legislation that we've seen begin to percolate up on the Hill, that's the biggest value add there. If we want to talk about SICI, um, you know, systemically important critical infrastructure, the, the basis of this recommendation, and I think the sort of value um, from where I sit is in a prioritization framework, right? And yes, we do have some prioritization frameworks. I would argue that the critical infrastructure framework is maybe a little bit too broad. You could pigeonhole just about any company in the United States into the critical infrastructure designation. Uh, section nine began to take a bit of a stab at, at further prioritization. I think, you know, it's built off of executive order. It lacks a little bit of teeth. It's not maybe as transparent uh, in terms of how companies are chosen as, as many of us would like to see. I think, you know, in an ideal world, we'd see SICI come in uh, through legislation and replace that Section 9 effort with something that provides a little bit more transparency about how and why companies are being chosen for this list. And then also provides, you know, frankly, uh, some guidance on the types of benefits that companies who are on this list should see in the form of, you know, closer collaboration with the federal government, both in terms of uh, the intelligence questions that we might have and uh, some of the operational collaboration pieces of it that Ben kind of touched on. But also, you know, we have to recognize that with that, there are going to be certain expectations that these companies have to meet. Um, you know, for the most part, I feel much of the private sector is doing a very good job on the sort of cybersecurity front, cyber risk management front, without necessarily the federal government telling them what to do. Uh, that said, there are certain minimum requirements that I think we can and should expect for systemically important entities. Awesome, thank thank you, Rob, and 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 very insightful, and 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 agree with all the points. Ben, I see you're uh, chomping at the bit, but 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 we only have about ten minutes, so I, I'd like to be able to. I mean, when we talk sicky, if everything's critical, nothing's critical. The flip side is, is no company left behind because because as we all know, small and medium sized businesses are the backbone and, and uh, of our country. So we need to ensure that uh, there is a role for them and we're able to plug them in. I, I'd be curious. You both brought up information sharing. And, and we've been around this issue for decades. Uh, when I say decades, I mean decades. Uh, and I'd be curious what both of you think the end state looks like. What, what is it we ultimately want to see when we talk about information sharing? And I've got some maybe grandiose ideas uh, that I'd like to see the private sector be able to do some intelligence requirement setting to be able to prioritize collection needs to meet the real world outcomes of industry. The flip side is, is industry is going to have access to information that I think is critical to getting that what the Brits call rich picture of the uh, broader threat environment. So 
Ben, Rob, I, I mean, what, what what does this look like? How do we how do we finally move the needle on what we all recognize as a problem? But but what what does it look like in in both your your worlds? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just to to finish out on the sicky point, I, one one small point I'll make is I think. Uh, you know, there's a number of industries that operate critical infrastructure that are already heavily regulated at a federal level. And I think, you know, as we think about obligations of SICI entities, uh, you know, deference to those uh, to those regulatory agencies that already have deep expertise and authorities to, to supervise certain businesses is going to be really important there. And then on the flip side, to get to your next question, I think and, he, I underscore one point there we, 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 and synchronizing all of that, I, I mean, yeah. We don't just yep. need another check the box. At the end of the day, when we look at, I'm always a mitigate before litigate or regulate kind of guy. I, I mean, I think incident reporting may be the exception to that because I think we need to get to that. But but it's using scalpels, not sledgehammers. So uh, I, I just had to put that plug in for all the chamber companies because uh, it's genuinely where I think we need to go. But but sorry, Ben. Yeah. Uh, no. And then and then on the flip side, if we designate critical infrastructure, I mean, it it makes logical sense then that we would also uh, resource and authorize our full national security apps apparatus to support that critical infrastructure, right? Like. This was always kind of a hypothetical discussion, a long tail event discussion. But right now we're living it. Uh, you know, a foreign adversary is is uh, trying to generate leverage against us and our foreign policy goals um, through the perceived vulnerability of our critical infrastructure to cyber attacks. Right. And so, um, you know, if, if we're going to take the step as a nation to designate critical infrastructure, it, it seems to me to be somewhat you know, obvious that that we then need to to back that up with the full resourcing and, and authorities and capabilities of the U.S. government. And so, you know, to, to in terms of the end state, I think really picking up off the information sharing is is useful, right? Like we created um, in the financial sector, we created something called the FS arc in 2015 and it's it, or 2016. And this it's no coincidence that it was in 2016 because it was after the 2015 CISA legislation passed, which, of course, enabled, you know, in a statutory manner. Um, greater information sharing and collaboration between different different entities around cybersecurity. Um, the idea with the FSR was, was to sort of scale that in, in a way that moved beyond just information sharing, where I share something with you and we both take action on our own, uh, to where we can collectively analyze uh, cyber risk as it presents itself to critical functions within the sector. We can develop mitigation solutions, and then we can use that knowledge to inform uh, our own company's collection of intelligence and, and cyber threat information, but also to inform the government to um, to be able to keep an eye out for threats and and conduct early warning and alert. Um, that work's gone pretty well. You know, it's been five years, um, and we're doing all of those things that I mentioned now. Uh, Rob can tell you that uh, last year, Energy was was compelled by the idea and the model, and so they joined this this FS Arc that's now become the Arc uh, as a as a cross sector form of this. And so, you know, I see that really as a, as a model that if we look five years out um, is going to be very meaningful. I think, again, I'd, I'd point to the to the focus of integration with with government. And I think that's our next goal is as we do this stuff in an industry led way, how do we make sure that government's part of that um, and, and gaining value from that and providing value back into it uh, and not sort of doing similar things in a, you know, in a parallel track, but but not an integrated one. Hey, uh, Rob, before you jump in, I, I just need, since it's all solarium all the time, need to, to put a, a, a foot stomp in for Tom Fanning, I think, who played a, a significant role in ensuring the FS arc became the arc and, uh, and, and the significant role he played. Uh, definitely. Definitely, Rob, want you to touch on information sharing. And then I want to leave, go, go a little off piste with a, a final question, threat fatigue. Um, we need to move beyond be scared to specifically what is it we can do. And I'm not suggesting, I, I give the administration huge kudos for leaning forward in some of the intelligence sharing. It certainly took the bite out of Russian disinformation campaigns, but but I'd be curious what your thoughts are uh, along those lines. So Rob, and then, and then two seconds by both of you on sort of threat fatigue. Absolutely. So I, I would echo everything that Ben said. I think he, he hit the high notes well. Um, you know, when I think about the Intel support and bringing, you know, closer collaboration between the federal government and uh, industry, um, you know, I think the ARC model is, is very compelling. The way that the energy sector is looking at the ARC is sort of long-term strategic risk. I think 
there's uh, there is some value in looking at sort of the a sector specific approach to the way that the the sectors work with the federal government, um, at least for now, and then thinking about sort of a hub and spoke model with the JCDC. And I think that that can feed into the intelligence support and information sharing piece of collaboration. And I would just say a few things on that specifically. One, declassification is good. And we're seeing the benefits of declassification that you just touched on, Frank, uh, in sort of blunting the disinformation campaign that we undoubtedly would be and frankly are, are seeing from Russia around the events in Ukraine. Um, you also touched on needs and priorities. You, you spoke specifically about intelligence collection needs and priorities. I think that's important. I also think we need to not lose sight of the importance of helping the intelligence community understand the analysis needs and priorities of the private sector. Um, those are obviously go hand in glove, but it's, it's worth calling out. And then the final piece, and I think this sort of plays at the end state conversation that you were talking about, Frank, is one of the things that's become very clear to us uh, as geopolitical events have escalated over the last couple of months is one of the things that we're lacking a systemic or institutional way to sort of, one of the things we're lacking a way to do is uh, get early warning when the US government or allied governments, for example, are about to take action that may lead to blowback on critical infrastructure. And I don't just mean we need to know when you're conducting a cyber attack. It's helpful for us to have 48 hours warning when you're about to announce that you're issuing sanctions as well, right? Any instrument of national power that we're gonna leverage, understand the need to protect uh, you know, critical operations and sensitive operations, but a little bit of warning, uh, it goes a long way in helping us batten down the hatches. Um, on the final note, and I'll just do sort of 20 seconds on this on threat fatigue, it's a point well made, Frank. I think, you know, it's it's useful for us to understand the threat, but at the end of the day, what we need to do is mitigate our vulnerabilities and understand our risk, which is a holistic look, not just a threat-based look. Threat is one sort of pillar in that. And, and I think, you know, to your point, the federal government has done a good job, especially since tensions have begun to rise, of helping us understand the threat. Um, you know, I'd still like to see the cadence improve. Uh, I'd still like to see the level of granularity improve. Uh, but I think we are taking steps in the right direction. Awesome. Ben, any final thoughts on that? And and, and I didn't mean to be sort of outlandish. It, 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 it's an issue that we all deal with every day. No, I, th I think it's great. And, and again, to reiterate, you know, the administration's done an incredible job, you know, and I view it as, as directly uh, learning from re near recent experiences of, of trying to get ahead of of these issues and declassifying information rapidly and and combating both combating disinformation attempts as well as you know providing meaningful uh, strategic intelligence to companies like ours that are preparing to defend itself and so I think I think it's an incredible lesson learned and I you know again just to, to reemphasize this would love to see see that resource in a committed way right I, I get the sense that you know, DOD and, and, the, and the IC are, are going out of their way to support critical infrastructure, but it's kind of a side hustle for them in some ways and that they're not like primarily funded and authorized. You know, there aren't cyber national mission forces or, or offices within the NSA that are specifically paid to come in as part of their day job and work with critical infrastructure. We've seen some of that taken up 5.1.2, I think, uh, in terms of the DIB and, and DOD's development of this cyber collaboration center. You know, I think as as uh, Representative Langevin uh, discussed earlier, and I was heartened to hear this, you know, supporting the idea of taking that model and adopting it to, to broader sections of critical infrastructure um, is, is going to help us be be better prepared in a more sustainable way. Because you're right, the, the, the threat fatigue is a real thing. We're all on high alert and, and working long cycles. Um, the more people we can have uh, committed to this work as part of their day job, not just during these times of heightened tension, um, um, but during the planning cycles as well is going to, is going to really pay off as we look forward. Awesome. Well, the tyranny of time requires, I'd be a bit of a tyrant. Um, uh, we're, we're out of time here and, and just thank you for your insightful comments and, um, and, and, and all things said and done when you think of the financial services sector and the energy sector, and we talk defense industrial base, all boats have already risen. But I think there are some other sectors that we as a country and, and Mark rightfully uh, Montgomery uh, earlier talked about the water sector. And we we do put that in the sicky or lifeline sector uh, category that uh, we need to batten down the hatches as much as we can. Um, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to 
Chris Roberti, who will uh, speak to uh, one of our, our great solarium, uh, former solarium commissioners, uh, Chris Inglis. So Chris, uh, Chris and Chris, over to you. director Chris Inglis, uh, a man who needs no introduction, but who has served at the uh, forefront of U.S. government policy, uh, cyber policy, and intelligence uh, for the better part of well, almost three and a half decades. Many years. Maybe, maybe Many more. Years. But uh, we'll leave it listen, we're, yeah, we'll, we'll <laughs> stay there. But we're, but we're thrilled to have you, Chris. And, uh, you know, I, we want to we want to spend some time uh, talking to you about a little bit about, you know, the Solarium Commission, your your take on it but also your current role as the National Cyber Director, uh, where you see things and uh, what we can look for going forward in, in some specific policy areas. So I'll, I'll turn it over to you for some opening remarks and then we can get into the discussion. Yeah, thank you very much for your hospitality and thanks so much for convening a session about Solarium. Um, wouldn't be a surprise, it's near and dear to my heart, not simply because I was on the commission, but largely the beneficiary of the commission in terms of what we're trying to do in the, in the office of the National Cyber Director. Uh, we're one of many beneficiaries, but if I look over my shoulder at what the Solarium Commission did across its largely two years in play, um, it, it essentially reframed what was believed to be possible and appropriate in this space. Um, for too long, we thought that um, a slow deterioration of what's happening in cyberspace was a fate, um, as opposed to what I think we now believe, which is it's a choice. We can choose not to allow that to happen. And so the Office of the National Cyber Director, one of the one of the byproducts of the Solarian Commission, owes a huge debt of thanks to the Solarian Commission for resetting what we think about this space and the degree to which we can stand in and control this space. Um, and I'd be remiss if I didn't kind of give a shout out to the other Solarian Commissioners and staff that are on this session. Um, so to Congressman Langevin and Frank Salifo and Rob Morgus and Mark Montgomery. Um, you know, miss working with you on a daily basis, but your ideas endure across time. And we wake up every morning in the presence of them are trying to move out. Uh, to the question of what the Office of the National Cyber Director is attempting to do, um, just to remind the audience, uh, we were created in January of 2021. I actually was nominated and showed up in July of 2021. But the money, the resources necessary to implement the office didn't show, show up until November. Now, that's all administrivia. But having said that, we're really a startup and we're just kind of on our, our sea legs at the moment, just in our early days. Uh, we have an ultimate plan to build to a size of about 90 people. We're about 30 people along that track. But more importantly, it's the thought leadership that we've extended from the Solarian Commission to define what contribution we would make. First and foremost, we've determined that the purpose of the power granted to the Office of the National Cyber Director is not, was not intended and should not be used to dominate the space. And we don't need a hierarchical approach to cyberspace or cybersecurity. On occasion, it's nice to know what the plan is. It's nice to know who's calling the script. But most days in this space, what you want is the concurrent application of all of the talent, all of the authorities, all of the organizations participating in some meaningful way in a collective defense. So our decision has been to define what value we add to the system as opposed to what space we occupy and what structure we might create. To that end, we've essentially laid out four broad lines of effort. Now, the first is to drive federal coherence. How do we make sure that all the parts of cyber within the federal government operate in a complementary way, unity of effort, unity of purpose, to include how we project services to the private sector through what are now called sector risk management agencies, and CISA, right, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. Um, if we, in fact, succeed in that, we'll be more proactive, more timely. Um, we'll, we'll be perhaps adding to the performance of the private sector because the government sees the private sector as the supported organization. And we'll make it such that for the first time in history, the transgressor in this space needs to line up and beat all of us to be one of us. As a byproduct of that first, we need to therefore encourage private-public collaboration. And not just within the United States, but in the largest possible environment, broadly across national lines, across like-minded nations. The international dimension of this is essential. Um, third, um, we're kind of 
driving down on or doubling down on future resilience. Um, we've actually performed quite well. I think some of our questions might get into that as a nation, as a society, in responding to cyber threats over the last several years. However surprising and unfortunate they have been, whether it's solar winds or log 4J or things of that sort, we've actually shown that we're able to react, um, to cover down and to drive these threats out of our system. But that's not a strategy and that's simply not a way forward. Um, if we did that well, if we did that even to perfection, we'd only lose more slowly. So we have to actually figure out how do we make these systems more resilient and robust, which is a principal line of effort of the National Cyber Director of making sure that we understand the doctrinal components of that, the people components of that, make sure everyone has the skills required, and of course, the technology components on that. The last thing that we've stood up and are moving out on is to do performance assessment. How do we understand how the various components of the federal ecosystem are performing, not just in terms of the expenditure of dollars, but in terms of do they have the right roles and responsibilities? Are they using those roles and responsibilities to the fullest, to the maximum benefit of the beneficiaries in the private sector, as opposed to perhaps for vicarious purpose, purposes within the federal government? I'm pleased to say that now about eight months into my tenure and probably two and a half months into the funding, uh, we're in a place where we have very significant lines of effort underway. Most of those are by, with, and through partners, whether that's CISA, uh, whether that's with the Office of Management and Budget, the Office of Science and Technology Policy, uh, we could go on, but those relationships are beginning to deliver coherence, proactivity, um, a proposition you gotta be all of us to beat one of us, and real and meaningful private-public collaboration. A lot of work to be done. Um, we've started with a pretty significant deficit in all of the things I've just mentioned, but I think building on the work of previous administrations and the Solarium Commission, we're moving forward. Thank you. You know, as uh, and, and you hinted at this in your remarks, you know, you've you your office has now been formally established for a year. You've been at it for you know eight months or so. Um, as you as your office and your team continues to grow and expand its capabilities, form partnerships like you were talking about. You know, what's what's your what's your maybe some specific ideas on on your direction for the office and how the U.S. cyber agenda might unfold. Um, you know. In other words, how do you envision your office evolving as cyber challenges increase in both number and severity? I think taking a line from the Solarium playbook, I think one of the biggest contributions that uh, the Office of the National Cyber Director can make is not so much in the doing. We have lots of doers. We have lots of folks who actually have technical capability, doctrinal capability to perform the actions necessary to create resilience in a collective defense. Therefore, I think our biggest contribution can be in the composition rules. How do we actually put those together, connect those such that they make a difference greater than their arithmetic sum? Thought leadership is perhaps what's most missing in this space, or maybe congruence and coherence of thought leadership. Um, so, for example, take the kind of the Solarium playbook, which says that we can meaningfully deter or change the decision calculus of people in this space. Both those who behave well, right, we can encourage and incentivize them to do more, and those who behave badly. That thought leadership needs to be extended into the future and into the international domain. Um, if, if I'm asked on a regular basis, I am, what keeps me awake at night? As much as I might like to say, I'd like to be Jim Mattis who said nothing, he keeps other people awake at night. There are things that in fact, you know, I lie kind of toss and turn about, but it is not specific threats or vulnerabilities. Those come and go and we need to address those kind of in order. Um, what I really worry about is the willful ambivalence of so many people looking at the space saying, clearly we now see that there's a problem. Something is amiss in this space. We need to do something about that. But then the willful ambivalence comes in, which is, but we imagine that it's somebody else's job, that somebody else will stand in and do something about that. Um, we've argued in a recent foreign affairs article that we need to have a new social contract. It's actually an old, old idea made new again, which is that we all owe each other something in cyberspace. As much as we came to that conclusion after 9-11 in the physical world, we all have a role to play. Individuals, organizations, sectors, governments, plural, all have a role to play. We need to figure that out. And a large part of my job as a member of Team Cyber, not the only one in this space, is to try to figure out what that larger collection of authorities, capabilities looks like and deploy it. So again, if you're a transgressor, you've got to beat all of us to beat one of us. If you're a defender, all of us can help each of us. Those are, I think, the two driving ambitions for us. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and this this is a nice uh, transition to our next question. You know, I want to talk a little bit about public-private partnerships. Mm -hmm. This is something that you've spoken out uh, very, very forcefully on. 
uh, both in your time uh, in the Solarium Commission, before the time in the Solarium Commission, and now as the uh, as the National Cyber Director. Uh, and that's that was one of the hallmarks of the commission. Um, and I think it was also why so many of the recommendations uh, ended up as legislation, because there was a collaborative process throughout with the private sector and other ag- and other organizations. Um, you know, the, the commissioners sat and met with people, took input, and I know that some of that input actually reflected in, in adjusted recommendations. Uh, your office has continued to do this, and 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 uh, in, in reaching out to the private sector uh, as you build your team and you build uh, your your plan of action. Do you anticipate having some sort of an institutionalized mechanism whereby uh, you can engage formalized in a formalized manner with the private sector to to allow for uh, two-way exchange of information, like an advisory board or something like that? And if so, um, you know what would need to happen? What barriers are there to this happening? Um, and what would need to be overcome? Yeah, so it's a great idea um, to kind of have some mechanisms, possibly plural, to um, instantiate and perhaps institutionalize over time an engagement, a role like the National Cyber Director with the private sector. That's It's essential that we do that. Uh, but, but for now, I think that there are actually quite a few mechanisms that already exist, and, and we're using those to the maximum extent. Um, the White House has always had something called the National Security Telecommunications Advisory mm-hmm. Committee, NSTAC. Uh, we use that. Um, kind of departments of commerce and others have had institutions like the Information and Security Advisory Board. We use that. Um, CISA by statute, right, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency at the Department of Homeland Security, by statute has a cyber um, kind of advisory board. I'm on that, right? We have the Cyber Safety Review Board. I'm mm-hmm. on that. And so I use any and all opportunities to engage through the existing mechanisms to essentially ensure that we continue to take the advice, the counsel, the influence of the private sector, which is absolutely essential. If in the fullness of time we determine we need something that's perhaps more bespoke, fit for purpose, I think that we'll work our way to that. But but for now, I think we have plenty of ways to do mm-hmm. that. It's the doing as opposed to the construct that I'm most focused on at the moment. Yeah, understood. Well, if and as that uh, time comes to pass, let us know. You've got a lot of uh, supporters and your office uh, has a lot of supporters within the private sector. Uh, I think Thanks. It's, it's important. Um, and this also, your, your mention of the, the, the Cyber Safety Review, Review Board um, brings me very nicely to my next question, but really related to information sharing. And, you know, what lessons have been learned from some of the recent um, significant cyber incidents? We talk about Colonial Pipeline or, or, or Solar Winds or, you know, a number of other ones where, you know, Not while, how much time do we have? <laughs> yeah, I know. But I think it's, it's interesting because these are really live fire exercises. And, and a lot came very quickly and um, which allowed at the same time that some of these mechanisms were being established, which then allowed people to sort of act and react and refine. So I I'd be very interested in, in hearing what you want. Um, so, so most of these, of course, are focused on the response issue. Sure. And so we have to step back perhaps just a little bit further and say, but what can we learn about the need for resilience mm-hmm. preventing these events? But, but having said that, let me just give a broad kind of observation, which is I think we learn again and again and again that we overestimate in many cases what the government knows. We underestimate what the private sector knows. And we sometimes at our peril ignore what we can only know together. It drives us back to a fundamental truth, which is that in this space, because it is a distributed activity wherein the build, the operation of it is essentially distributed broadly across multiple entities, we have to figure out how do we collectively, collaboratively um, participate in making it resilient and actually then defending it. And and so I think if there's a lesson to be had across all of that, um, it's as we kind of as we begin to think about how do we make it more resilient and how do we respond in a way that we can actually meaningfully defend that space collaboration comes to the fore as the biggest lesson of all. That being said, we've learned a lot about the technical underpinnings of this. Um, there's a straight line from the Solar Winds event to the Executive Order 14028, which the federal government kind of imposed on itself to say, we're going to get our digital house in order. We're going to put some mandatory components like multi-factor authentication, like encryption technology, those things that have shown themselves over time to be very, very helpful and not simply deterring, but preventing these events, we're going to do that. Um, on top of that, we are kind of now understand what unity of effort, unity of purpose can bring us in terms of how we behave on that digital enterprise within the federal government. So practices kind of have been born of these, these lessons. And then finally, public-private collaboration, which if I've said that three times, I'm probably three times short of saying it enough. Um, we have to make sure that 
as we understand what resilience is and as we understand what a collective defense is, that we do that in a full partnership with the private sector, taking advice and counsel at every step in the way um, from the sector that frankly does most of the work in innovating, developing, deploying these capabilities to which the government can add its unique insights, its unique powers, whether that's convening power, regulatory powers and everything in between in support of the private sector. Mm -hmm. well, that, yeah, that's, that's, very, that's very helpful. And again, you know, you had mentioned the executive order, and I think that the next, you know, area where I wanted to discuss is, is regulatory harmonization. You know, the chamber and many other organizations were 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 fairly were very supportive of the president's executive order on cybersecurity because it outlined a comprehensive approach. It it as you said, it it directed the federal government to get its house in order, and then used its uh, authority in contracting to sort of push down some of those things to those who are contracting with the government. And is our understanding that you know, through that, you can build some of these practices, best practices that will then be further adopted organically, right? So that's, we, that's very good. Similarly, with the cyber incident reporting legislation that passed earlier this year, uh, the business community uh, was able to get behind it. You know, there, were, there was, you know, there was push pull, nobody got everything they wanted, but everybody got some of what they wanted. And, and, and we ended up uh, in a place where everyone could live with it. Uh, and, and I think our support, very supportive of it. At the same time, and so now we're in the getting to the regulatory, the rulemaking process. But at the same time, there's a lot of new cyber uh, rules, regulations that are being pumped out, whether it's from uh, the FCC, the FTC, the SEC just dropped another rule. There's letters flying around uh, governors. And, and it, it becomes a little bit of a, of a whiplash, I think, for the private sector, um, where, you know, it seems like there was a con constructive and coherent construct happening through the executive order, through uh, through the incident reporting legislation, uh, but at the same time, there's other regulations coming in, and so how how can how can we work to, to sort of harmonize some of these regulations where entities aren't reporting to seven different you know organizations that once they report to the government that the government has it will distribute it will then feed back to the private sector information. Yeah, it's a great general question, and some specifics inside of that you know, are more than worth some time and attention. So, so let me just kind of offer a broad observation up front. This world was on fire when we got here. Right? <laughs> the, the regulatory relationships are longstanding, right? You know, they, they, and they were born largely of the days 20, 30, 100 years ago when most of these activities that are regulated were independent of one another and independent of digital infrastructure. And, and so those exist to this day. And the muscle memory um, and the instincts are, are still sound in terms of some degree of regulation by exception is required in these various critical infrastructures. But the question now is how do we harmonize those, not just to one another, but to digital infrastructure. And so that work is now kind of a pace where we're beginning to work our way through that. Having said that, I would want to unpack just a little bit a distinction between the cyber incident reporting bill um, and regulation in its own right. Um, you know, while there is a requirement to report information attendant to intrusions, we have to separate that from a pure regulatory activity. Because just like FEMA, which would respond to hurricanes in the physical world, we need something equivalent to the National Weather Service to direct those efforts. That's really the purpose of the national or the cyber incident intrusion reporting bill. How do we have information so that we can then take the scarce resources and, and respond right to incidents in progress or understand the broader strategic trends and address those by building in the resilience, robustness, and perhaps the government services necessary to attend to that. So let's take the intrusion reporting, which again, we, make, we need to make sure that that is harmonized across 54 states and territories with what the federal government has laid on the table. I think the rulemaking period that's now begun in earnest will help us do that, but separate that from those various regulatory responsibilities and authorities that have existed for a long time. And let's harmonize those as mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. right? And, and that's not just across the federal government, but of course, across states and territories and in the international domain. Many of the companies that are likely to tune into this session today don't operate just in one state. They operate in 54 states and territories, don't operate just in one country. They operate in multiple countries. They have a real need for some degree of harmonization, rationalization, so that when they do, in fact, respond um, well and faithfully, which I know they intend to do, they can do it in the most efficient way possible. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Well, that was, and thanks for clarifying, you know, between reporting and regulation. I think that's an important, uh, that is an important uh, distinction. So, uh, and, we, and we appreciate that. Um, 
look, I think, you know, we're, we're, we're coming up on time and, and I know you have a very busy schedule, but um, I, I, I just wanted to, you know, you, you had mentioned the, the social contract and, you know, you, could you, could you talk a little bit about, you know, what you envision? You wrote, you, you wrote a good article uh, in, in foreign affairs uh, and uh, you know, co-authored it. And, um, you know, for those that may not have seen it, you know, you want to talk a little bit about the, the relative roles and responsibilities of, of, of the actors. We've got civic society, you've got the government, you've got, uh, you know, you've got, you've got companies and the like. Uh, what the article does, and again, this is essentially taking what you can learn from a great many um, thought leaders in this space, and we're essentially just trying to capture all of that and say, what does it mean for us in terms of going forward? It tries to actually assess where we are in this kind of development of what we used to call the internet, take the internet plus, um, kind of think of it as what I describe as cyberspace, and say, why are we in a difficult place at the moment? It, it's very likely because um, we have failed to understand you know, what the true threats are in this space. And while those threats might be attributed to nation state actors, criminal actors, maybe even complacence occasionally nature, a lot of those threats we allow to occur because we've not attended to our knitting in building resilience and robustness into the underlying architecture. What then results is that a single error, error think of the colonial pipeline, can lead to this national security issue or this confidence, this destruction of confidence as people in a broad kind of geographic area suddenly imagine that because the digital infrastructure is not up to the game, because somebody made a single error, that everyone now is at risk. Um, that is a disproportionate kind of um, embodiment of risk in one action that simply is inappropriate. So we need to make sure that we kind of stop thinking of cyberspace as an event that we can simply show up and react to events and actually get well ahead of that to say, how do we build resilience and robustness in so that we prevent those events? That's lesson one. Lesson two um, in this is that we have to think of cyberspace as more than technology. It is technology and people and doctrine, meaning that people are in cyberspace, the decisions they make determine the outcomes in cyberspace. We need to make sure that every person, not just those with cyber or IT in their job title, is up to the game. I don't need everyone to be a Python programmer, but I do, do need them to know as much about kind of navigating their efforts in cyberspace, participating in their defense in cyberspace, as they do about driving a car in a busy, in a busy, busy city or navigating a hot stove. And so how do we do that? And at the same time, then make technology more intuitive, more appealing to them in terms of the safety features built in. But perhaps most important in that resilience posture is how do we get the roles and responsibilities right? If in fact, there should be a greater burden borne by those who make and deploy these capabilities, then let's do what we've done in the automobile industry or the aviation industry or the food and drug industry. Let's actually levy that burden at the start, which is we need to build resilience and robustness in so that we can sustain that over the life cycle of these systems and get to a place where we restore confidence in our ability to use these systems, cyberspace, for the purposes that we thought we were kind of undertaking in 1990 or the early days of, of the internet and not perhaps obsess about the threats in this space, but rather reachieve initiative in this space so that we ourselves can get on with our personal kind of aspirations, our business aspirations, societal aspirations, even national security and diplomacy. So the two things that then fall out of that in this new social contract is we need to agree that we, we all have a responsibility um, to each other to play a meaningful role in the defense of this space. Doesn't matter whether you're an individual or an organization or a government, we all have some responsibility. It's not somebody else's problem. And two, we need to actually invest in resilience by design so that we can prevent the events. And when we have to respond to them, do so collaboratively so that all of us can participate in the defense of any or each of us. Put another way, if you're a transgressor, you're gonna to have to beat all of us to beat one of us. That I think can move the needle. That's the whole point of the article, which is to essentially capture a lot of great thinking that's out there to say, what then do we do about that? How do we put those aspirations to action so that we can get on with the business of using cyberspace for the purpose intended, which is to achieve those things that we, the defenders of this space, wanted to do in the first place. Chris, I, I think that is a fantastic place to end. Thank you so much for your thoughts. Uh, there's a lot to think about. You, you articulated a, a vision. You, uh, you, you, you uh, identified issues where we have to work more. Uh, but I think more importantly, you provided some hope and, and some really good context for people. So thank you for joining us. It's, it's a tremendous pleasure to have you. 
And uh, we're, we're so pleased that uh, you and your team are, are doing the good work that you're doing. Chris, thanks for your hospitality, the Chamber's hospitality. And thanks again, a good shout out to the Solarium Commission. What now, three years in, two years intensely. Um, so we're doing our best to realize that vision. And good luck to all of us, since all of us have a responsibility to play in this space. Thank you. And thank you to our audience for, for joining us today. We hope you found it uh, all of our sessions interesting. And uh, we'll be doing a lot more this year. And we'll hope you tune back soon. So thanks again for joining us. And we'll see you next time. Thanks. asked about the governor.